All right, history students, we are moving on past the Spanish-American War. Um, we're going to move into foreign policy, our, our new foreign policy. Um, we have today and then tomorrow, uh, and then we're going to finish up the, the chapter and take a test on it Monday. So review will be on Thursday for Chapter 9 and Chapter 10, and then test will be on Monday. Um, so you'll have a review on um, Thursday. Um, so... Our journal up on the board says, do you think that media has an influence on the United States society? So you can either pause this or move on. Um, if your sub wrote it up on the board, that's even better. All right, let's move back so you can see the title so you can write it down. And remember to take notes because you get credit for it. The New Foreign Policy, Chapter 10, Section 3. So this individual over on, on the right hand is Teddy Roosevelt or Theodore Roosevelt. Um, I love to use um, political cartoons because it tells the story of what the people were feeling at the time. They draw out their emotions, the social climate that's um, currently going on. So we're talking right now the turn of the 20th century. We're talking the early 1900s. Um, the Spanish-American War was just wrapped up. Um, we are going through the Industrial Revolution. Um, the Foreign War is going to happen, the 30 Years War here pretty soon with the two world wars um, combined. And then um, we'll move into the Great Depression also in between that. So there's a lot that's going to be happening in the next couple of months that we talk in terms of history. So we're going to start with Teddy Roosevelt. We talked about him gathering a kind of a ragtag group of individuals during the Spanish-American War. He became very famous when, um, with the, the charge of San Juan Hill, the Battle of San Juan Hill. You're going to be doing a worksheet on that today um, after this um, video or before. It just depends what your sub has you do. Um, so let's, let's get going. Given all the Americans' international activities in the late 1890s, the United States entered in the 20th century as a genuine world power. So this is something that we were we were not involved in um, foreign affairs. Um, George Washington very famously stated, how, you know, stay out of it, don't meddle, keep to our own, and we did for a long time. And um, but eventually the world has become very globalized. We affect each other in terms of economics, military, um, resources. Everything is now combined because of the way we can we can basically transportation. We can get around the world um, quickly. So one one thing that was kind of critical and and very important. I'm going to back out of this little square because you can see this on the map is that it took a long time to get from New York to San Francisco via ship and we sh we sh we had a lot of stuff that we sh shipped across because we didn't have airplanes at the time we were the right rollers were just coming around creating it but there's no way we could carry cargo on these airplanes yet so in New York you had to go all the way around South America round and then back around up to San Francisco so if we could find a way, which there's a little narrow passage through here, and that's Panama City. So Colombia is right here. Costa Rica is over here, Nicaragua. Um, then we have Honduras. But this little area right here is basically we, we could build a trench and, and con connect that through. So that's what the game plan was. But we had to figure out a way because Panama was actually a providence or connected to Colombia, and Colombia refused to work with us. So Americans de desired a shorter route between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. This canal across Central America would cut the distance basically in half or less or more. Um, Panama was the ideal location because of the landmass was smaller, very narrow, and they could get the water in and out. So if you look right here, this is where Panama is. So the, the land mass is a lot smaller right in through here. And this um, Colombia was connected, or Panama was connected to Colombia. So if you look right there. So Panama's independence, it was critical to ha um, help them out, which we do. We, we do this all the time, still today. We... Um, helped out Panama rebels 
to get um, their freedom so that they would work with us and negotiate because Columbia refused to. So President Teddy Roosevelt, so William McKinley was assassinated and Teddy Roosevelt, who was his vice president in his second term, became the president of the United States. The revolt took place in 1903 with United States warships waiting offshore to support the rebels. America immediately recognized Panama and they signed a treaty giving the United States permanent land grant to build their canal. Well, they kind of felt like their hands were tied because the United States helped them um, free themselves from Colombia. Theodore Roosevelt and the Panama Canal. In 1901, the assassination of William McKinley thrust Vice President Theodore Roosevelt into the role of President of an emerging power. Roosevelt, unwilling to allow European nations to dominate international political and economic affairs, was determined to make the United States an even more powerful force on the world stage. In 1905, building on the achievements of the Open Door Notes, Roosevelt managed to mediate a peace negotiation between Japan and Russia. The two nations had been fighting for control of possessions in Manchuria and Korea, and the successful negotiations won Roosevelt the 1906 Nobel Peace Prize. As Roosevelt's presidency continued on, America's role in international affairs continued to grow. France, Great Britain, and the United States had all envisioned a world in which a canal could provide a shortcut between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. As early as 1850, Great Britain and the United States had agreed to share operating rights of such a canal if it could be built. However, in 1901, Britain granted exclusive rights to such a canal to the United States. In the late 1800s, France had attempted to build a canal in Panama, but their efforts had failed. In 1903, President Roosevelt and Congress purchased the rights to this Panama route for $40 million. Roosevelt saw the completion of a canal in Panama as a military and economic necessity for the United States, and he was determined to make it happen. Panama, at that time, was controlled by neighboring Colombia. When negotiations with Colombia to build the canal failed, Roosevelt worked closely with French officials to orchestrate a revolution in Panama. When the fight for Panamanian independence broke out, Roosevelt sent Marines and nearly a dozen warships to Panama to secure control of the territory in the Isthmus of Panama. Fifteen days later, the Hay Buena Varilla Treaty was signed with Panama, granting the U.S. control of the canal zone area. The U.S. agreed to pay Panama $10 million, plus an annual rent of $250,000 for control of the area. Construction of the canal began in 1904, and the completion of the project remains one of the world's greatest engineering feats. More than 43,400 workers battled diseases such as malaria and yellow fever, unfavorable terrain, hot, humid weather, and torrential rainfall. Work was not completed until 1913, and some 5,600 workers lost their lives due to accidents and disease. The total cost for building the canal was $380 million. The canal opened on August the 15th, 1914, and more than 1,000 ships passed through during the first year of operation. However, U.S. efforts in helping to stir up the rebellion in Panama, along with the aggressive naval actions in the area, greatly damaged America's image in Latin America. Resentment of the United States would simmer in the region for decades to come.
So just like um, the Civil War, there's a lot of people that died from disease. Um, malaria being one of the most deadly, which still today is one of the most deadly diseases in the world. All right, you can see this picture of um, Teddy Roosevelt and little guy down here, and in his little feather it says Columbia. So political cartoons are always good to talk about because of what they're thinking and their thought process at the time. So Teddy Roosevelt's pretty large with a cannon pointed at him. Columbia doesn't surrender and decide to help him out. So, Col so Teddy Roosevelt comes in and helps the Panam Panamanians surrender. All right, here is a, a visual of what the Panama Canal looks today. So on this side right here, you can see that they fill up these and then they slowly, gradually um, push these ships through. It's pretty expensive to go through there too, by the way. Um, this is what it looked like when they were digging out the Panama Canal over 100 years ago. So construction of the canal began in 1904 and lasted until 1914. The canal was a huge undertaking and operated with a system of locks and channels. So these are the locks and here's the channel. Here's a video of how the Panama Canal works. The process of transiting the Panama Canal is very similar for every vessel, from a sailboat to an enormous cruise ship. Each vessel accesses the locks through their gates to reach a height of 26 meters above sea level. A control house operator closes the gates to the locks and then opens the valves that control the water flow. It takes eight minutes to fill the chamber to elevate the ship, which is kept in the center of its transit by locomotives. This operation is almost exactly the same at the three sets of locks in the Panama Canal. It takes between 8 and 10 hours to transit the Panama Canal from ocean to ocean. More than 10 million ships have done it since its opening. Hold on. All right, moving forward with um, Teddy Roosevelt and his um, policy. So one of the big things with Teddy Roosevelt, you know, I talked about, speak softly, um, but carry a big stick. He was very, very open and very vocal too. Roosevelt believed that if the U.S. displayed military and economic power, there was the rest of the world would obey without resistance or conflict. And so he wanted to show that America is a world power, not just, you know, in the region, he wanted to show worldwide. Theodore Roosevelt had been the greatest political force behind the Spanish-American War. He saw America's emergence as a world power, not only necessary for survival, but a duty. He felt Americans had a responsibility to civilize the rest of the world. He made the country realize that we now, in a post-Spanish-American War era, had a global responsibility. We were no longer a country being born, that we were now a world leader. And that with that came a new kind of global responsibility. Roosevelt, more than anybody, believed America needed a canal through the Central American Isthmus owned by Colombia. The thought was this canal was going to be a way to protect both seas of America, that any moment if the East Coast was attacked, the West Coast fleet could quickly come to its aid. Now, Roosevelt believed this canal, the Panama Canal, would be a very good thing for the United States, but he believed it would also be a very good thing for the world. The Colombian government didn't exactly agree with Roosevelt, at least not at the price he was offering. So, once again, Roosevelt took unorthodox measures. He backed a local revolution and helped create the nation of Panama in exchange for the right to build a canal there. 
He was criticized very heavily for his high-handed role in dealing with the government of an independent American republic, for basically giving them the back of his hand, and for fomenting revolution. But he never apologized. He used to say, I didn't steal the Panama Canal, I built it. It was the largest engineering project ever undertaken. And when it was completed, it became one of the wonders of the world. When it opened, Roosevelt believed that that was his major contribution to world civilization. He never changed his mind about that. But America was not the only one infiltrating Latin America. Increasingly, European powers were moving into the region, ostensibly for the purpose of forcing debtor nations to repay their loans. Roosevelt found their presence a strategic threat. Without consulting Congress or asking permission from Latin America, Roosevelt invoked the Monroe Doctrine and stated that the U.S. was now in charge of the Western Hemisphere. Roosevelt announced that henceforth the United States would consider that it held a police power, that was the term he used, to enforce good behavior on the countries of the Western Hemisphere. This was simply his way of saying, if somebody has to clean up the neighborhood, it's going to be the United States. It was a bold position to take, and Roosevelt backed it up with what he called big stick diplomacy. I mean, his famous quote is, speak softly and carry a big stick. Meaning you don't have to yell at people abroad, but at every minute you have to be militarily prepared. The big stick is your arsenal. It is your Navy. And this was a way of intimidating other countries in realizing that we were going to fight for American rights. If you sacked a consulate somewhere or if you intercepted and impressed an American ship, there were going to be consequences. So Teddy Roosevelt invoked the Monroe Doctrine, which, what is the Monroe Doctrine again? Basically, it states that we will take care of anybody in the Western Hemisphere and that we will make sure that no other countries from other parts of the world will take over anything. And so we kind of babysat the Western Hemisphere. Um, Roosevelt issued a message to Congress that became known as the Roosevelt Coronary on extension of the Monroe Doctrine. He was one of our youngest presidents, too. He was in his 40s when he became the president of the United States. Let me see if I can fix that. Hold on. There we go. Roosevelt denied that the United States was interested in acquiring new territories, but that they would intervene to stabilize political and economic affairs in South and Central America. This signified a very formal shift from American isolationism to interventionalism. Let's see what we have here. At K-12, I'm ready. K-12 is tuition-free, online and in person. The great fundamental issue now before our people can be stated with. It is, are the American people fit to govern themselves, to rule themselves, to control themselves? I believe they are. My opponents do not. I believe in the right of the people to rule. I believe that the majority of the plain people of the United States will day in and day out make fewer mistakes in governing themselves than any smaller class or body of men, no matter what their training, will make in trying to govern. I believe again that the American people are as a whole capable of self-control and of learning by their mistakes. Our opponents pay lip loyal to this doctrine, but they show their real beliefs by the way in which they champion every device to make the nominal rule of the people a sham. I am not leading this fight as a matter of aesthetic pleasure. I am leading because somebody must lead or else the fight would not be made at all. I prefer to work with moderate, with rational conservatives, provided only that they do in good faith strive forward toward the light. But when they halt and turn their backs to the light, sit with the scorners on the seats of reaction, then I must part company with them. We, the people, cannot turn back. Our aim must be steady, wise progress. It would be well if our people would study the history of a sister republic. All the woes of France for a century and a quarter have been due to the folly of her people in splitting into the two camps of unreasonable conservatism and unreasonable radicalism. 
Had free revolutionary France listened to men like Turgot and backed them up, all would have gone well. But the beneficiaries of privilege, the Bourbon reactionaries, the short-sighted ultra-conservatives turned down Turgot and then found that instead of him they had obtained Robespierre. They gained 20 years' freedom from all restraint and reform at the cost of the whirlwind of the Red Terror. And in their turn, the unbridled extremists of the terror induced a blind reaction. And so, with convulsion and oscillation from one extreme to another, with alternations of violent radicalism and violent bourbonism, the French people went through misery toward a shattered goal. May we profit for the experiences of our brother Republicans across the water and go forward steadily avoiding all wild extremes. And may our ultra-conservatives remember that the rule of the Bourbons brought on the revolution. And may our would-be revolutionaries remember that no Bourbon was ever such a dangerous enemy of the people and of freedom as the professed friend of both Robespierre. There is no danger of a revolution in this country, but there is grave discontent and unrest, and in order to remove them, there is need of all the wisdom and probity and deep-seated faith in and purpose to uplift humanity we have at our command. Friends, our task as Americans is to strive for social and industrial justice achieved through the genuine rule of the people. This is our end, our purpose. The methods for achieving the end are merely expedients to be finally accepted or rejected according as actual experience shows that they work well or ill. But in our hearts we must have this lofty purpose and to strive for it in all earnestness and sincerity for our work will come to nothing. In order to succeed, we need leaders of inspired idealism, leaders to whom are granted great visions, who dream greatly and strive to make their dreams come true, who can kindle the people with the fire from their own burning souls. The leader for the time being, whoever he may be, is but an instrument to be used until broken and then to be cast aside. And if he is worth his salt, he will care no more when he is broken than a soldier cares where he is sent, where his life is forfeit, in order that the victory may be won. In the long fight for righteousness, the watchword for all of us is spend and be spent. So that was a speech from Teddy Roosevelt about isolationism and interventionism. Um, he believed that we needed to pr protect our interest in our on our continent. Under Roosevelt, U.S. intervention in Latin America became common. This angered many Latin Americans, as you can imagine, somebody stepping in our business that would make you upset who felt Roosevelt independent foreign policy strengthened his powers while undermining the authority of Congress. Hang on, I don't know why it keeps doing that. So make sure you write this down, it's in yellow. Elected president in 1908, William Howard Taft was not as aggressive as Roosevelt in his foreign policy. He promoted economic control over military, over military control he also wanted to substitute dollars for bullets. So they called it the dollar diplomacy. He's a, the um, president that got stuck in the White House bathtub when he was taking a bath. And then we move af past um, Taft, we move into Woodrow Wilson, who becomes our president during World War I. Um, the next president was Woodrow Wilson, amidst a bloody Mexican Revolution. Many encouraged Wilson only to protect United States interests. Wilson believed Mexican revolutionaries um, to be tyrants. He also, um, and we must also intervene in his viewpoint on moral grounds. And so his was called the moral diplomacy. So Taft was the dollar diplomacy and Woodrow Wilson was the moral diplomacy. So the United States withdrew from Mexico. Um, Francisco Pancho Villa, a peasant rebel was furious with the United States and he began terrorizing Americans in the Mexican border and raiding U.S. towns. In 1916, his men burnt down Columbus, New Mexico. And then we have John General or General John Black Jack Perishing. Um, Wilson sent him in with 5,000 um, to pursue Villa, Pancho Villa. After many bloody clashes between Persian forces and regular Mexican troops, Wilson withdrew troops. 
and Pershing's um, troops never actually found Mia. All right, so that is all for today. Make sure you work on your worksheet and finish that up. Um, and then tomorrow we'll wrap up chapter 10 and we'll move forward with a test. And then you guys have your states and capitals test next Wednesday, or actually next Tuesday, I'm sorry. So make sure you're studying that also.